Well, hello everyone. Welcome back to Adrian's Digital Basement 2 Super Mini Mail Call. It's not so mini today. This package comes from Aaron down in uh, the Los Angeles area. Let's see what we have in here. All right, well, the first thing is, is a pillow. I think these come from Walmart, perhaps? Um, it's actually not a bad way to pack something. Uh, these pillows cost like $2, I think. And obviously, it's very squishy. All right, we have another pillow, a little one there, and another one here. This one looks like it was probably homemade at some point. A little kitty cat on the bed there. What we have here, TRS-80 Color Computer Multi-Port Interface, or Multi-Pack Interface, which of course allows you to use up to four cartridges on your old Coco. Now this thing has uh, seen better days. Oh, I think it's got the old sticky rubber feet syndrome, so we got some packing tape on there, and yep. I have to wonder about this right here. I've seen something very similar to this on my old beat-up TRS-80 Model 1. The original edge connector wasn't very high quality and therefore it became very fragile where if you like touch the interface, oh, this is on the Model 1, you potentially like crash your computer because the expansion interface is connected directly to the CPU data bus and address bus. Now this thing here goes on, you actually solder it on both sides and then you have gold contacts that theoretically are gonna offer a better connection. But I guess you have to dismantle part of this thing Oh, I don't know. This thing's in pretty rough shape, so I'm not sure how well this is actually going to work. Does that show up on the camera? There's definitely corrosion stuff there, but maybe that can be cleaned up. I think the reason for the blankets and the pillows was that Aaron was cleaning up his elderly mother's house and found this stuff in her garage, and there was probably an excess number of blankets and pillows, so he figured, why not just use that as packing material? So next thing up here is a Coco game cartridge. Downland from Radio Shack. I think I only might have the odd TRS-80 color computer cartridge, so that's kind of cool. All right, next up is something that has definitely seen better days. There's definitely some uh, corrosion and sticky feet from the bottom of the expansion interface. Yeah, it's looking a little rusty there. But what this is, is an external floppy drive. Very interesting mechanism here. I don't know if I've ever seen this before. So this would be just a normal sugar art style interface floppy drive. And interesting is the cable is not here. So it would have come out right there. Would have been a ribbon cable to plug into a floppy drive interface for the computer, but no cable, which unless someone yanked it super hard, someone would have taken the cover off of this to uh, remove that. The final thing here, and it's the TRS-80 Color Computer 1, Coco 1. So I'm just going to get it out of here. It seems to be stuck to another pillow. Hopefully this thing works, and if not, maybe I can fix it. So let me move this packing material out of here, and let's take a look at these computers. All right, here is the TRS-80 Color Computer, and I have it sitting on an old uh, t-shirt just in case. Uh, I don't want that sticky residue to be on my the desk here. So yeah, this I think is one of the, the early models. I'm not totally sure. It says up here 16K of RAM with this little sticker. And it's got this, um, you know, old school looking keyboard. The computer appears that it was very well loved when it was uh, used, because you can see like the wear marks right here from wrists that did a lot of typing. Well, it's funny that it's over here and not where you'd expect it to be kind of more in the center here, but Maybe whoever was using that, that's uh, how they typed. Machine's pretty dusty and dirty. It's obviously been stored in a garage or whatever for a very long time. Here's that cartridge slot on the side. This is where that multi-pack would go. And then also kind of unusual when we turn this around. Um, what's this all about? So there's three extra cables that run out the back of this machine. And when we take a look at the ports on here, we have joystick right, joystick left, serial I.O. cassette, out to TV, so that would be RF out. There's a channel selector switch. All of the TRC color computers from the first one here all the way to the, the end of the line had built-in power supplies. So there's a power switch or right here. That's the power switch, and that's the reset switch. And this actually has, wow, has a grounded plug as well. I'm pretty sure my Coco 2 and 3 only have a two-pronged plug. 
All right, let's take a look at the bottom of this thing here. So the feet that are on this apparently aren't the sticky type, although one has come off. Serial number 41,214. So maybe that's a low number in the, the sequence. I don't really know. There's some of this really sticky stuff right here and here, obviously came from something that this was sitting on. So we have a couple stickers here. So this one here is the Sound Center Radio Shack dealer in uh, White Rock Shopping Center, Los Alamos, New Mexico. Interesting, anyone ever shop there back in the day? Perhaps Los Alamos didn't have its own Radio Shack in the early 80s, so there was a dealer that did sell Radio Shack stuff. I don't really know how that works. There was always Radio Shacks that I remember um, branded stores my entire life. That was back in Canada, and then of course uh, in Los Angeles, where I grew up as well. And then there's a Radio Shack warranty void sticker here. Uh, breaking the seal voids your service warranty, and of course that's already been broken. So it sounded like there was something floating around inside of here. So why don't we get the screwdriver here and let's crack this open. Uh, let's see how the case condition is. You know, it's very dirty, but it's not unbelievably bad either. I think this might clean up to some extent. Now, part of the problem is, of course, if you watch the TRS-80 Model 1 or Model 2 video, that is, the paint it's painted and it can get very scratched up, kind of like car paint and oxidized and everything else. So it may not end up looking super great, but you know what? That screw is the original screw, so that's good. That one is as well. Now, while I own a Coco 2 and a Coco 3, I have never owned a Coco 1, the original here. So I don't know which screws to take out. And unlike Sony devices, there are no arrows. But I can tell in the back of the case here are longer screws than in the front where the keyboard is. So I need to try to remember that. Let's see with those out, does it lift? Nope, doesn't seem to come apart yet, so let's keep going. I mean, the fact that I turn these screws and it makes a crack sound kind of implies that whenever this thing was serviced, it was a long time ago. So maybe this was like an official mod there. Maybe that allows you to hook up a cassette player to this thing without using the special cable, or maybe it's a composite mod. I mean, it could be any of those things, right? Is this thing free yet? No. Let's see if we can get this thing apart. Oh, something's floating around in there. Okay, yeah, that's free. All right. All right, so there's the inside of the case. Yes, spray painted on the little overspray there, but nothing's broken here, so that's good. All righty, so there is the inside. And um, well, 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 look at all of this here. I'm gonna move the camera so you get a top-down view of all this. All right, here is the top-down view. <laughs> Let's zoom in and check out this stuff here. All right, well, we got some bot wires here that are connected. Um, <laughs> it's funny. So one goes from this leg here, the 6822 over to this IC, has some legs that are lifted. I mean, who did these bodges? Pretty amazing. Look at this long wire here. It goes under the keyboard or something. Let's lift that. Yeah, it makes its way around here. It goes to this little PCB between this uh, ribbon cable from the keyboard and a normal you know, pin header on the motherboard. Uh, down here in the corner is some tape or something. Nothing under the keyboard. Everything looks pretty much okay there. All right, back to the bodges. Um, okay. <laughs> It's funny, like what, what is this? There's just loose wires. All right, so we have three wires here. One goes to the motherboard there and two are on these two pins of the cartridge connector. And I'm assuming that this electrical tape here was probably taped on there because there's a black wire right here that's also got electrical tape on it. So whatever mod this was, was undone at some point. Next up in the mod potential, there's just a mod that goes from the 6822 here over to this capacitor and it's just like a, a resistor. It's a long resistor that's just soldered on there. There's no attempt to, you know, try to make that neat or anything. It's just like, bleh, let's just mod that on. And actually there's also this resistor right here. I think I might've missed that originally. So there's one there, one there, and one there. Just regular like quarter watt or half watt resistors right on the ICs besides these little bodge wires down here. And then we have this, and I am quite sure this is the Motorola MC1372P. So this is the chip that takes the video output from the video chip, which is this IC right here, and it helps convert it to 
well, a signal that the RF modulator here can use. So I'm, I'm pretty positive that this is some kind of, whoa, very bent up composite mod for this thing. I guess even back in the day, people wanted to have composite mods. So there you go. And it has this clip lead right here, which is just a standard clip lead. And I wouldn't be surprised if this clip lead, like I said, is taking the audio off the RF modulator because when you plug into this chip socket here, you're only gonna be getting a video circuit or a video signal, no, no audio. So we might as well try to, uh, well, fix these bent pins here. And let's try to use this mod board here. This thing was probably made by hand at some point, this board here, I mean, it is, it definitely looks handmade. The nice thing is it's using this long pin socket. So that's what these pins are coming from, they're actually coming from the socket. So that means that um, this retains the RF modulator capability when because this IC is still gonna do its job for the RF modulator. All right, I think that should work well enough. Let's get some deoxit, put it in that socket there because the pins are pretty crusty. I love seeing that this machine has a period correct composite mod. How freaking cool. So I'm kind of surprised whoever installed this, they put a zip tie there. Why didn't they just put a zip tie around this right here so that it would kind of hold it? I'm gonna do that right now. That way that offers a little bit of strain relief to these wires. All right, let's make sure that, okay, that looks connected. This is good. Everything else on here, I mean, it's sketchy. I'll take this tape off, that's not doing anything anymore. Everything that's on here is sketchy but should do the trick. Wow, there's a lot of jumpers on here. Hmm. Incidentally, this here is part of the power supply. So I think under there, right there, that's the transformer for the machine. And then this is like a little bit of a switch mode or not switch mode. I think it's maybe a linear power supply or something under there. There's double-sided tape on top of that PCB just so you don't put your hand on there and get electrocuted or whatever. It's probably mains voltage there. Obviously this is probably a five volt regulator. This machine, what kind of RAM is in here? Has this thing had a RAM upgrade? Uh, these chips are kind of corroded. Looks like MCM6665L25, but the date code is 1981, which kind of matches the rest of these ICs. Although actually the 6822 uh, years from 1984, so that's been replaced. But this is all 81, everything else on here. 81, 81. Can't see the video chip now that I covered it up. Oh, you know what? Actually, I just did a quick Google in the 6665BP or whatever these are, 64 kilobytes. So this thing's had its RAM upgraded as well at some point, but 1981 chips, these look at these really nice gold chips here. So cool, a little bit of a, another mod. I mean, this thing is clearly was well-loved, well-used machine. All right, enough chit chat. Let's power this thing up, see if it works. All right, so I don't have to move the camera. We're gonna use this LCD screen here. Let's move the t-shirt though. So, um, oops, this thing is, uh, you know, the one I've shown on the, the channel before. I do have it flipped around in the OSD. So it says no signal the correct way there, even though it all looks like it's upside down. And that's just because it's such a pain to get to those connectors when it had this little stand on there. So it's, it works a little bit better this way. And for a video cable, I'm gonna use this ancient thing here. <laughs> oh, you know what? I should actually plug uh, this cable straight into this monitor. I am completely guessing that that is the right way to connect this up. So that these, these two female jacks are like the audio connections to go to like a, your speakers or, or stereo or something. And that this cable right here, which is connected, um, that would be the video. Okay, let's see what happens. Here we go. Oh, you know what? I'm like, well, that was anticlimactic. Uh, you know, how many times have I done this on camera? Like, gone to, oh, this plug is super gnarly, dirty, and yucky looking. Is that gonna work? Let me try to clean that up a little bit. <laughs> All right, I cleaned it up just a little bit. It's still terrible, but the fact is, uh, it's a low current machine. It's not gonna draw much current, so it's not that big a deal. Let's make sure that's off. All right, here we go. Now, there's no power LED, so I have no idea if this thing's even on. Let's get the multimeter. All right, we're getting a nice solid five volts, so that implies that the machine is definitely turned on, but yet no picture. Maybe that is not the video output. I plugged into one of the other cables. Let's see if that does anything. 
All right, look at that. We actually have an image. I mean, it's a, a non-working computer, but it is definitely, that is composite video. Neat. Sorry for the glare on the screen there. Uh, let's push the reset button here. I don't expect that to, of course, magically make it work. It doesn't. But I have to say that is pretty cool. That does output. So you know what? I'm gonna try the other connector. Not that there's gonna be video. I mean, it's gonna be the same picture. Oops. Um, I just wanted to see if like this is a, a duplicate of both of these connectors are video. No, they are not. I wonder what that one is. All right, well, this one is the video connector. So I need to label it as such. All right, there we go for the future. So I saved myself a little time trying to figure out which is the video. All right, well, this is not gonna be a repair video, but I think it's pretty cool that there is some signs of life on this thing. Let's see if doing reset again. Does it change it at all? No. All right, so to the Coco experts who are watching, do you have any ideas, A, what these bodges are, especially in this area right here, and then B, what this stuff might've been used for at some point? And then finally, if you recognize the symptoms of what we're seeing on screen here, like, is that what uh, Coco does if the machine's not executing code? Definitely put comments down below. So when I do a repair on this machine, I will have some ideas of where to look. But, you know, I'll do all my normal troubleshooting as usual. Could well be bad RAM. You know, who knows that goes wrong with this stuff. Though these RAM chips are not hot and they are nice and beautiful looking. But yeah, it could be any of these other ICs that failed. Luckily, ooh, that chip is really, 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 really hot. Let's turn that off. This chip here is the 6883. And yes, that is um, that is burning hot right there. Ooh, so I'm wondering if that's faulty. And this chip up here is the processor, the 6809. That's just slightly warm. Let's see if these are, the machine is off at this point. No, everything else is okay. It's just this one that's really hot. Now, luckily, I'm pretty sure I have a spare set of ICs. You know, in fact, I'm gonna just pull this out and let's give that a try because I don't know. It might be the hotness is normal. But I don't really trust that. Let's just lift this out of here. In fact, I'm just gonna see what happens if I turn this machine on with this IC removed. Let's just see if this has the same exact like symptoms when we turn it on now. And actually, no, without that IC in there, we don't seem to get any kind of picture whatsoever on here. So maybe that is working actually, and it just gets hot normally. All right, I went over to my spare parts and I grabbed this, which was a Coco 2 motherboard that I found. It was a machine that was basically left for dead. The case was rotted out, everything, lots of rust, but the motherboard worked. So because the case was gone, the keyboard and everything, I just saved the motherboard. And I'm assuming it's got one of these ICs. Yeah, there it is right there, it's from 1983. So let's pop this out. Ooh, these chips are really stuck in here. I don't even think I ever took these out. Come on, I don't want to break any pins here because a lot of corrosion. This thing was like left out in the rain and, and everything. There it is, the chip popped out. As I said, even though it was left for dead, definitely was a working machine. Oh, these pins are in terrible looking shape. They're all like corroded and they're all oxidized. So let's deoxid that socket. All right, here we go. There it is. Now let's turn the power on. Nope, no change. All right, so that IC is not bad. Something else is. It's actually a couple of like letters over there now. Yeah, I don't remember. I, I may not have noticed that on the first time around. All right, well, good to know. The cool thing is, I have an entire set of chips there. So I'm gonna put the original one back in here. I mean, I guess there's a possibility actually that the corrosion on this wasn't making good contact and well, that is still the problem, but I, you know, I don't think so. So I'm just gonna stick this one back in here, not damage it or anything. Okay, that's good enough, it's in. <laughs> the original IC from 1981, much better condition legs. No corrosion that I can see on that one. All right, I'm gonna stop fooling around with this machine now. Clearly we're gonna have a future repair for a TRS-80 Coco One, which is kind of cool. Like I said, I've just never really had to work on one of these before. Like they're so resilient that even this one here, Left for Dead, totally just worked. So this will be the first one that I'm not gonna actually have to troubleshoot. <laughs> oh, and actually before I put it together, this is what fell out of it. Flip off, you know, I'm, 
I'm pretty sure that this is a, a, a cover for a vial, like an insulin vial or something like that. So I wonder, Aaron, was your mother diabetic or someone in your family? Because I'm pretty sure that's what this is. Flip off. You flip the cap off before you can draw out any of the insulin. And there's like a little metal cap there. I think that's what that was. And that's, um, that's what was floating around in here. And remember with these, the longer screws, they go in the back of the case. So there are three that were on this machine. And we have two up for the front with the keyboard. And I think if you use the wrong screws, like you put the long ones in the front, it will actually damage the plastic on the case. It'll, it'll poke through on the top. And before I set this aside, I'm gonna to try to clean off this goo here. If you don't do that, this can get onto clothing, onto like if I put this down on something, it can transfer onto that. And I really, really don't like that. The first try some WD-40 on here. See if that removes this. No, not really. Okay, I have switched to 50% IPA, and that is working far better than the uh, than the WD-40. So yeah, use that if you're trying to get this uh, gunk off. At least, well, at least this particular gunk. I'm gonna try to be careful right here around the sticker. Don't want to accidentally take that off. Seems like the sticker is plastic coated, so it's sort of protected. So look at that, cleaned right up. Now there's a little bit right here, which I'll try to get off. Okay, there we go. 50% isopropyl did the trick, and this, this label's plastic coated actually, so it's kind of protected. So that was good. Now I'm just gonna give this a quick wipe down with Windex. And the Windex is mainly just to get the, the dirt off. There we go, just like, a, just a minute of cleaning this Computer already looks so much better and quite a lot of stuff's coming off on there. Similar treatment here. And there we go, just a little bit of elbow grease and this looks a billion times better as well. Ooh, that's keyboard. <laughs> it's really not very nice to type on. I don't think it ever was even back in the day. I think there were aftermarket keyboards you get for this that were a bit better. Now this keyboard is definitely not the one that came off the original Coco uh, One machines, color computers. They were more like square keys, I think. This was sort of like the later improved design. I think there's gonna be some people watching are probably experts about the TRC color computer and they could tell me in the sequence like where that old keyboard was versus this new one. And maybe this was like an aftermarket keyboard that was upgraded at a later time because it was easier to type on. Not really sure. It's just doesn't feel so great. Uh, for later, when we do the repair, I'll do more cleaning. I think this should all come off sort of like adhesive residue and it's all around here. So a lot of that should be gone. There's a bit of scratches on the plastic, but it's not too bad actually with a little, with a little extra cleaning. And of course down here, this is always gonna be there, but that just shows that someone was using this computer and they really liked it. Just, I'm still curious about why the wear mark is way over there and not like, where you would actually be typing. So anyways, cool. Okay, let's move on to the other things. All right, I'm gonna put the t-shirt back because I think, uh, let me grab the disk drive next. So this is the very dirty five and a quarter inch disk drive here. So let's open that up. It's got some of that sticky, horrible residue on it. Now the screws on here are really, really rusty. But what I think is really cool about this, hopefully this is a, a good mechanism in here and a good little power supply, because this could be a good little external disk drive that would work, say, for the Coco, which actually, incidentally, I have the disk drive cartridge. I bought that at Portland Retro Gaming Expo, I don't know, 2018 or 2017, from a seller there, and I paid only a couple bucks for it as well. So that allows me to use something like this on the TRCD color computer, any of them, incidentally, or GoTech also works. But this could work on anything else as well, like the TRCD Model 1 that uses the same exact disk drive interface. It's just the good old Sugard interface, which is common to all sorts of things, PCs as well. So yeah, the floppy cable, it's just missing. So I can see here, drive select zero, there is no terminating resistor here. So this would have been used in a chain of disk drives. And that's probably why the cable is missing. That's my hunch, is that someone had a cable, like a ribbon cable that had multiple connectors on it, and it came in this case, connected up, and then went out to the other disk drives. I mean, it's possible that it could have been the only one, but you really need a terminator for it to work. And since it's removed, that's what makes me think that this was in a chain of disk drives. So someone must have opened this up, pulled that cable off. What kind of disk drive is this? I really, I don't recognize this, this controller whatsoever. And on the side here, SA99991, like what? 
What is this? Let's look at the other side. Nothing. Nothing at all. I mean, it looks like there was a sticker here and that's gone. And then of course, here is the linear power supply. So the mains comes in, goes through a fuse, there's a transformer or the power switch as well. This will bring it down to probably something like, um, well, maybe 10 volts, something like that. Then we have a bridge rectifier here. There's four diodes, these two large caps. And then right there we have two voltage regulators, of course, five and nine volts. And that's uh, right here, powers up the disk drive. Pretty simple stuff, but you know, does the trick and probably still works just fine. Ah, look at this right here, JMR Electrics, Northridge, California. Anyone recognize this company? I notice right here it says Remex. Don't even recognize that as a brand, but maybe that's who made this disk drive. It is double-sided. There are two connections for the heads right here. That's the stepper motor, of course, for moving the head assembly. And we can't see on the bottom if it's like belt drive or what, but I'm gonna make an assumption that this is a direct drive motor. It's not a belt drive for the spindle, that is. And look at the day codes here. This says 1988. No, that's not possible. That can't, that's not a valid day code. 82, 83. Yeah, so I'm gonna say this is from around 1983. The mechanism though is fascinating with this uh, clicky latching mechanism here. That's just interesting. And it hasn't broken, so the plastic is still in good shape. You know, it would probably break right now. That would be my luck, right? Why don't we give this drive a little bit of a test? So what I'm gonna do to do that is I'm gonna remove it from the case here since it's all rusty anyways. And we will test this on a disc or on a PC that is. So the disc drive, it's an Excello Corporation disc drive. Remex division. All right, so the spindle motor spins. Let's see if the heads move. They do indeed, and it's not too scratchy. Let's lubricate that up just a little bit. Okay, just a couple drops of silicone lubricant there and that seems to work better now, a lot better actually. I'm gonna switch this over to drive slick one since we're gonna use this on a PC. Oops, my phone beeped there. All right, I have the Pentium test bench here hooked up to this monitor. Let's power this off and plug in the power connector. Let's see if this drive spins up even. I'll just keep it top side up in case anything blows up when I power it on for the first time here. Here we go. Well, it made a clank sound. So there's like a relay in there probably to load and unload the, the heads. Let's just slide a random floppy in here and see if that motor spins at all. No spin, but let's power this off and on. Well, kind of moved a little bit. If there's no sign of life when I try to access this, then I'm gonna grab a Terminator. We will just set this to 360K drive. It does say nothing's detected. So that might be because of course there's no uh, Terminator on there. Now I do know that this particular BIOS on this, uh, it's an Intel motherboard. It doesn't even seek the floppy drive at all, but it does detect it, I think. Let's go back in the setup and see if it, if it shows anything detected. Oh, look at that, it actually worked. Yeah, floppy A installed, cool. All right, well, we're gonna start with a head clean on this drive since uh, well, it's probably a little dirty considering like how the rest of this thing looked. Although the inside of this drive looks really clean. So maybe there's actually no issue there, but we'll do it anyways. I like to use IMD for cleaning the drive because it actually has a clean head option here, which just seeks the head back and forth kind of exercises the, the stepper motor as well, which I lubricated. Sounds like it's working well though. All right, let's see about this disc. Now this actually has something on it, but it's not PC formatted. It's like an MF formatted floppy. So if we go to align heads, let's hit enter. Oh, that sounds bad. It's reading the disc properly though, but Sounds really terrible. Listen to that. Okay, well, we know at least it's running at the correct RPM because you can see that on the sticker here. We don't even have to run the speed test tool in there. But why does it sound so horrible? You know what? I think it's the bearing on the top here. Let's close this out disc in there. Yep. Okay. Let's see if I can get some lubricant in there. It's visible there and I have this 
bearing oil here. So I'm just gonna put a drop of this in there. And let's see what that does. Oh, it still sounds terrible. Okay, after fiddling and putting lubricant, it's still making noise. And now it's actually not reading properly either. And I notice if I push the clamp to the side, so it should be reading 18 with the beep at that frequency. But when I let go, it's losing sector. So it's not reading the disc reliably and it's definitely something to do with the clamping going on here. It's not like the head itself. And that's because of course, when it clamps the disc, it can move the disc around slightly. So I don't know why it's not clamping properly. Well, and unfortunately, physical problems like this are very difficult to fix, at least for me, at least. And I don't even know how this drive is supposed to work. It's not like I have another one to compare to. And like I said, it's definitely a clamping issue. It's moving this around. Well, it kind of goes all over the place, but it's not gonna read discs properly like this. That's for sure. We can try though. All right, so it sort of is reading it. There we go. SCOM, whatever that is. SCOM. See if it can actually read this. General failure, hit R for retry. It's funny, now it's not even spinning. What happened? The drive LED's on. Oh, you know what? Is this a bad connection here? Well, definitely some flaky problems on this thing. Let's try SCOM fix. Okay, well, it's making pretty unhappy sounds there. I'm gonna run the floppy disk test here and check it. Disk inserted, yes. We're not gonna write to it, so we'll skip it. We'll let it do the full. Whoa, now it's doing that horribleness again. I almost feel like what's happening here. Oh, yeah, okay. stop it, stop it. I think the stepper motor here for the head is getting jammed. In other words, it's missing track skips. It could be because this drive is just too old for the PC and the PC is trying to move the head too quickly. And then what happens is say it tries to go to track like 30 and when it goes, it actually only ends up on track 20 and then it thinks it loses track of where it is and then it starts banging the head um, into the stop. It's not necessarily a failure of the drive. It could just be that this drive is just not designed to step that quickly on the track skip because early disk drives, like including the original Sugar SA400, it needs pretty slow step speeds. Wow, this uh, stepper motor is pretty warm. Anyhow, I could probably troubleshoot this video for hours more, at least it's kind of working. Um, so I'm gonna stop troubleshooting this and put this aside for now and maybe that'll be a future video at some point in the future. This is a, a mail call video, it's not like a, a floppy drive repair video, right? <laughs> All right, here is the cartridge expander thingamajiggy, whatever this thing is called, the multi-pack interface. Let me just give this a quick clean because it's very, very dirty. Okay, that's a little bit cleaner now. So it's got a power switch right here. So, cause that's obviously a power cord coming out here, built-in power supply to power up all the cartridges or whatever that you're gonna plug in. It's just the tape there making that sticky noises. So you put in up to four cartridges in the top of this thing. This obviously plugs into the side of the computer, sort of hangs off. And on the front right here, we have a switch, one, two, three, and four, which is not moving very well. So I'm not gonna try to force that in case it breaks. We'll open this thing up and take a look inside. So that obviously allows you to select which cartridge you're gonna use much more easily than having to constantly unplug and plug stuff in. And I think that really helped out people who played games, but also had the floppy drive interface because that would be a cartridge that would plug into say slot four here. And then you have the ribbon cable hanging off the back. That way you didn't have to constantly plug and unplug the cartridge off the side of the machine. You could just leave that in and put, put your game cartridge in here, switch it to one, play your game, shut it off, switch it around. I mean, there's still a lot of power switches to turn off and on and remember how to get it all working, but it was probably more convenient than constantly removing cartridges. Let me zoom in on this connector here. So this is what I was talking about. So the original edge connector would have been further back in there. And when this plugged into the computer, I guess it would have gone in a little further. This little thing goes on top of the old edge connector and then you solder it on. So you take this thing apart to do that. And then this is, these are gold contacts, which look really bad. Well, I'm just gonna spray it with Windex, why not? Let's see if I get to grab the cloth. What does that look like under there? How bad? I think it is quite corroded, unfortunately. It's 
cleaner. <laughs> it's just really, really pitted, that one especially. Like, can I use something like Brasso here to try to clean up those contacts? Would that work? Let's flip this over and take a look at the bottom side. So here you can see how each of the pins there was soldered onto the original edge connector. So the original edge connector is still there. I mean, maybe I can clean it up, but it's possible that from many insertion and removals that it got worn out and no longer works properly anymore. All right, let's try to open this thing up. I need to try to get these rubber feet off. First, I wanna get this tape off because this packing tape, if you leave it on, it really starts to leave a horrible sticky residue. Oh, look at that. That's so gross. This one is turned to total goo. It's just like those uh, rubber belts, you know, and old tape decks and stuff. It can turn to like a horrible sticky mess. This is just a large version of that. <laughs> so let's see if it's possible to get these off without being horrible. Oh, you know what? It's kind of working. Now I've had stuff before where just like those old tape decks, the feet turn to total wet goo and just bleh and it's just as hard to get off. Let's use some heat. See if I can get under there. First, I try to lift it up with that plastic spudger and then I'll use the uh, needle nose here. Oh, there we go. That came off. Of course, now it's stuck to my needle nose because it's <laughs> the top has turned to goo. And while I'm at it, I can get this rubber piece off the bottom here. I currently have my hot air set to 136 degrees Celsius. 136 is definitely hot enough to melt plastic. And there we have it. Those horrible feet have been removed. Like there was a little couple spots where the goo had left behind or stuck behind. So I removed that with the 50% IPA as I did on the computer. And now it looks pretty good. I just need to finish cleaning these up at a future time and then I will get some new replacement feet. Of course, that's if this thing even works. I mean, with this whole situation there, this, this thing may be a goner, unfortunately. All right, let's take a look in the multi-pack. It's got the long screws on here. There we go. All right, so there's the top cover <laughs> with the little cartridge doors. Hello, hello. While I have this off, I'm gonna spray Windex on this, this stuff here to try to get that clean. All right, and there's the inside of the multi-pack. I wonder what this wire's all about here. Maybe there was an RF shield on here. There must have been a shield originally. In. All right, so there's the little selector switch. Does this move? Oh yeah, it does. It's just pretty gummed up. Let me get the contact cleaner. I'm gonna use the old QD stuff here because it sort of gets rid of the gunk or whatever that might've been inside of this thing. Yep, and look at that. Now that moves nice and smoothly. Evaporates very quickly. It's very flammable though, so be careful. I'm not sure what this red wire is about, so I am gonna cut it off. All right, this is where the cartridges go under this paper here. I'm really surprised at the number of ICs in here. There's like a PAL, a bus transceivers. There's a lot going on. I would have thought it would have been much, much simpler. So if anyone has any like theory of operation or knows more about this, like can you use multiple cartridges at the same time? And I notice here that the switch is gummed up again, even though I cleaned it. So I'm gonna get out the old fader lube here, deoxy fader lube. Let's get this in there. Hopefully that kind of brings it back to operating smoothly again. Oh yeah, look at that. That's much better now. Fader lube has a lot of lubricant in it. So when you use something like this, it washes away any of the grease that's in there, like inside a potentiometer or whatever. So you really need something that can reestablish that lubricant again, which this fader lube is good for. I don't use the fader lube for like normal cartridge slot deoxid kind of purposes, because that's a little bit too much. But for something like this, where it needs that lubricant in there, I'm just gonna wipe away the excess here. Uh, it's perfect. Anyhow, obviously testing this thing requires a working machine. So I'm just gonna kind of put this back together here and that will be for a future test as well. Maybe once I get the computer working, I can plug this thing in and see if it works, but I'm just not holding out hope because of this. This just, this does not look good. And the backside is slightly better, but only slightly. If we're trying to fix this, I'll probably end up having to use the Dremel on it, but that might expose the copper. It's probably gold-plated copper. So if anyone has any like good tips on what I should do to try to 
bring this thing back to life again so that this thing might work, please let me know. I'll be very, very curious. And spraying some Windex on here, letting it soak, clean it up very nicely. And the switch on the front here, that's working much better now. Yep, that's good. And that is gonna be it for this Super Mini Mail Call. Thank you, Aaron, for sending in this TRS-80 color computer, the original version. I have since learned, because a little bit of time has passed uh, since I recorded the first segments of this video, that this is an early Rev-D motherboard version. And the fact that the badge is over here on the left side implies that this is one of the earlier machines. Although it wouldn't have originally come with this melted keyboard design, it would have come with the chiclet keys. So at some point, someone upgraded it, probably when they used it a ton and they found that this one typed a lot better. There, of course, will be a future repair video of this machine to see if I can get it working, which I'm pretty confident I can, especially because that Rev-D motherboard that's in here, as we saw when we looked inside, is entirely socketed. So that is really easy for troubleshooting perspective. Anyhow, that is gonna be it. Thanks for watching. I wanna thank my patrons. Their names are scrolling up the side of the screen right here. If you wanna become a patron, you can do so at the link in the description below. Put your comments down below if you have any to make on this machine. Maybe you were a huge fan of the color computer back in the day and you had one of these things and had many fond memories of it. Oh, one more piece of housekeeping. There has been some spam on both my channels lately and on some other channels I've noticed where there is a fake YouTube account that says uh, telegram me at like Adrian's Digital Basement or something like that. That is not me. I would never post a comment asking you to reach out to me directly like that. I would always say to email me at the email address on my channel about page. That way you know you are talking to me and not some kind of scammer, which is obviously what that is. That is a scammer. They are probably asking for money or personal information or something like that. Do not talk to them. Don't give them anything. And if you see one of those comments, please hit the little report button and report them. And also, if you see a fake channel like that, uh, that says Telegram me or anything like that, that looks like me, but it doesn't have the videos and stuff, then definitely report that to YouTube as well. And I guess that is going to be that. So thank you very much for watching. Stay healthy, stay safe, and I will see you next time. Bye.